All right. Good morning. I should say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, clock just switch over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Darren, and I'm one of the marketing coordinators for the School of Health Sciences. It is my pleasure to welcome you to BCIT's School of Health Sciences information session for the medical radiography program. First off, I want to say how happy we are that you are all here, and thank you for attending our presentation today. And uh, second, feel free to post your questions, comments, and thoughts into the chat during the presentation. And we will address as many questions as we can near the end of the presentation in the Q&A section. And third, if possible, please keep your microphone and video turned off until the end of the presentation to reduce connectivity issues and interruptions. That is greatly appreciated, thank you. And just before we get going, I would like to say that BCIT acknowledges that our province of British Columbia is located on the homelands of 203 distinct indigenous nations and cultures with over 30 different languages and close to 60 unique dialects are spoken in the province. We ask all participants to reflect, acknowledge and honor in their own way, the first nation land on which we live, work and play. So, thank you for acknowledging that. Our agenda for uh, this afternoon is uh, welcome and introductions, which we're doing right now. We'll do a quick poll question, and then we'll move on to presentation and program overviews. And then we'll do program advising before the Q&A section near the end. I'm going to introduce Denise, who is the program head for medical radiography. And uh, please take it away, Denise. Thank you, Darren. So uh, my name is Denise Pelzer. I am the program head from for the medical radiography program at BCIT. Um, in the poll, you can see that there's uh, several teams that are part of a hospital setting. Uh, the only team that we're not really part of and that really isn't a team is the biopsy team. So it's a bit of a trick question. Uh, we are part of the trauma team, we're part of an, uh, the OR teams and we're part of the code blue team. So um, if there's cases going on in usually any of these areas, we're usually there um, and involved. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about what our um, what an X-ray technologist or a medical radiographer is. Um, so what do we do? We use sophisticated equipment to produce radiographs or anatomic images of the human body. Uh, these images are read by a radiologist who provides a diagnosis or a treatment rec recommendation if it's required. Although there is a technical side to the profession, a technologist's main focus is on the patient to ensure their safety and comfort while they're in our care. It is a dynamic, fast-paced profession where every day is different because every patient and every exam is different. Our program trains individuals to safely use highly technical equipment that produces ionizing radiation uh, to acquire the images that I mentioned or the series of images and to take care of our patients. We work closely with students to help them become part of the healthcare team where the focus is on patient-centered care. Next slide, please. So um, there's different equipment that we use. They all produce ionizing radiation, uh, but they also produce different types of images. So um, the most common one that we know of and, and um, we see is general radiography. And so these are, um, um, it's general or uh, most basic equipment that we have. Um, they produce two-dimensional images of bones and body systems. So if someone falls or gets hurt, or has a pain in their chest or abdomen, we can take an x-ray and get an, an immediate result. Fluoroscopy um, is more of a dynamic imaging. It's like creating a video. Um, so if you're um, looking at the function of a system, so if somebody's having difficulty swallowing, we can give them something, some lovely um, liquid to drink called barium, some chalky substance. We ask them to swallow it and we can actually see them swallow and see what's happening in their stomach as this um, contrast goes in. The other thing we can do um, is work with, when we work with the radiologists, as um, they can place a needle into a joint to either place um, pain medication or a steroid, or even again, a different type of x-ray contrast to actually show the inside of the joint. So that's more, again, 
um, like a video. CT imaging um, or computer tomography is more of a three-dimensional imaging. And so this is like taking a slice through a body or a body part and then standing at the foot end and looking up. Um, this allows us to see the anatomy in relationship to the other organs. Um, and, and again, gives us a more three-dimensional representation of the anatomy or the inside of a patient. Uh, the other thing that we can do with, a com with computer tomography is um, that we can use a computer to take the data that's collected through scanning a patient and actually create three-dimensional models of the organ system so that a radiologist can bring it up on a screen and actually spin the anatomy around so they can actually see it from different angles. Now, using all three above, uh, we can do interventional procedures, and this is just a little bit more ad advanced, still, but it's still part of our scope, um, where we would be using fluoroscopy or um, using like the CT scanner to actually do uh, preventative uh, treatments. Uh, for patients. So this sometimes proceeds actually having to have major surgery. Uh, we can actually do procedures in the interventional suites where we can place some um, uh, guide wires, or if somebody is having chest pain and their vessels are blocked, we can actually go in and place stents. We as in the radiologist, but we're part of the, um, the, that team. Uh, and again, running the equipment. Uh, we also do mobile imaging, so same principles as mentioned above, uh, using dynamic, static, and CT imaging, but with mobile equipment. So if a patient can't come to the department, um, this allows us to go to the patient. For instance, in the operating room, where a surgeon uses a C-arm, so this is um, a mobile fluoroscopy unit, um, to uh, mend broken, broken bones. So if somebody comes in with a broken arm or leg, and the two pieces of bone aren't connected, the, fluor the C arm allows them to realign the bone and then put plates and screws in so they can actually see where the screws are going and that they're in the right place and that the bone is in the correct alignment. Um, we can also go to the emergency department or the trauma room um, or to a patient's bedside. Again, they can't come to us. Um, we actually, I was part of a team that took a mobile unit to the aquarium, this was several years ago, uh, when they still used to have orcas and actually or, um, x-rayed an orca jawbone. So we can go anywhere. The equipment is pretty heavy and cumbersome, um, but we were able to get it into a moving van and get it to the aquarium. So, you know, we do have um, lots of places that we can go. We also do imaging in the uh, morgue. So for uh, hospitals that are forensic centers, we can go down to the uh, morgue if they're uncertain as to the cause of death. Um, the last area that we work in as well uh, is mammography. So this is using specialized equipment uh, to image breast tissue, looking for um, like breast cancer and that type of pathology. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a bit of a, an overview of our program. Uh, our most recent intake of uh, was a cohort size of 64, uh, which was a decrease from 80 from previous years. We work closely with the ministries of advanced education and health to determine our cohort size. Um, uh, and a cohort means that it is a group of students that actually move through the program together. So you take the same courses during the same term and you advance through the program together. Um, the right now there is actually an increase <laughs> in um, uh, of jobs for X-ray technologists, uh, partially due to COVID, um, partially due to a lot of retiring going on out there. So it's kind of nice to see that um, there's quite a few jobs opening up for our students, our graduates. The program itself is um, two years in length, so 24 continuous months. There are three terms in uh, each year, so for a total of six terms per year in, in the entire program. Uh, the terms are different lengths, which will determine the length of the courses or clinical placement being offered. Um, we are in the midst of making several changes to the program, one of it, which is the um, start date, and you should have seen that on the website. Uh, this change is to ensure that our graduates are available for the start of industry hiring cycle, which begins in early spring. Uh, the next intake will be January 2022, and we will graduate um, that cohort December 2023. 
there is a national certification exam that is written at the end of the program. And that exam will be offered in January 2024. Next slide, please. So in order to benefit our learners, the program alternates theory instruction with clinical practice. Um, our program starts with an academic term, uh, which at this time consists of online theory courses and hands-on applied labs. So even during COVID, we are bringing students onto site to um, do positioning labs and physics labs. Uh, and we are following all the guidelines and making sure our students are safe and wearing PPE. During non-COVID times, most of our theory courses are offered face-to-face, -face, but again, I'm not sure what the new normal is going to be when we come out of this. Um, classes focus on technical aspects such as physics of X-ray production and the safe use of the equipment. The less technical courses, um, but still the center of our profession, are the principles of positioning, analyzing the images, in relationship to the anatomy, patient care, and human behaviors. So this term lays the groundwork for your clinical experience. So each academic term is followed by a clinical term where students put into practice what they have recently learned, alternating throughout the entire program. Uh, due to the tactile nature of the profession, hands-on practice in our labs during the academic uh, term is essential. The courses in the term are aligned so that the anatomy is taught immediately prior to the to the learning of the positioning and the image analysis follows follows the practicing of the positioning in the applied labs. Our program uses very unique VR experiences that allow our students to be part of the anatomy and pull it apart and layer by layer and section by section. Um, this is very unique to our program. Uh, Francine Anselmo, who's one of our instructors, has been working with our um, teams at BCIT to create what um, she calls the Be the Beam um, project, where um, a student can actually experience how an X-ray beam is produced and how it gets to the patient. So for any of you that might know of the Yellow School Bus series, where Miss Frizzle would take her students in a yellow school bus and shrink down and go, say, into the blood vessels or in through the digestive system, so it's the same idea where you're now actually part of the equipment and you can actually see how, um, how the x-rays are formed and how they interact with the body. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, clinical practicums are, like I said, a very big part of our program. They always follow an academic term and the program ends in a clinical term. Approximately 50% of the program is clinical experience. Depending on the term, it can be anywhere from a 30 to a 30 to 30, sorry, try that again, 30 to 34 hours per week. Uh, students take online courses during the clinical term to enhance their clinical experience. They are given academic time during their week to work on these courses. At this time, we have 16 clinical sites which are spread out throughout the Lower Mainland, in the interior and in the Kootenays. Students go to two cl clinical uh, placements and are provided input into those placements. Students enter choices into a computer program which will place them at sites with available seats. This means there is a possibility that a student may not receive any of their choices and may even be sent out of town if they wish not to go, but it is, um, it is part of our program that everybody does go to a clinical site. So all clinical placements are final once they are posted. Although there are three clinical terms, students only go to two clinical sites. Um, a trauma or high acuity center, such as a, uh, if you're in the mayor, more, bleh, lower mainland, uh, VGH or RCH, um, a smaller community style hospital would be um, a hospital that is the size of maybe Burnaby Hospital. Um, each site has a clinical instructor who is an x-ray technologist who is responsible for the students. They manage the students' schedules, do cases with them, review images with them, and, and along with mentoring them through the profession. Students will be on a variety of shifts so that they can become familiar with the workload on each of those shifts, making them more hireable at graduation. Um, a shift can be any day shift uh, during the week, so the entire week, Monday to Sunday, uh, day shifts, afternoon shifts, uh, and night shifts, so midnight shifts, um, which is all part of um, our professional cycle. 
Um, at the successful completion of the program, the graduates must write a national certification exam, uh, which will uh, allow you to be certified to work anywhere in Canada. Next slide, please. So fun facts. So we are a 24-7 profession. Um, if an uh, emergency room is open in a hospital, you can guarantee that there is a, um, an x-ray technologist on shift there, or at least on call. Um, we not only do images for diagnostics, but also for therape therapeutics, just as I was speaking before regarding the uh, interventional procedures that we do. We work closely with our patients, whether they are in our care um, for minutes or for hours. Some of our exams are as short as five, 10 minutes, and some of them could take up to a couple of hours. Um, we must have good communication skills and patient care skills. Our graduates work both in hospitals and in private clinics. Um, our equipment allows us to go where every patient is. Um, and I already spoke to this, but it is a, a very large portion of our, our workload um, where we can go to the operating room um, and go to ICU, go to the patient wards, um, go everywhere the, the patient is. Uh, we uh, also, um, and as I did mention before, we do go to the morgue, which I find is a very unique uh, situation. Um, you see a lot of shows like NCIS or CIS um, and where the, the, the pathologist will, you know, be doing the x-rays themselves. So that usually in real life, um, an x-ray tech goes down and actually takes those images. Next slide, please. So job opportunities, um, a, junior, a general duty technologist's hourly wage um, in a hospital usually ranges anywhere from $30 to $38 an hour. It will all depend upon the years of experience. So usually starting out, it's $30 an hour. Um, the pay scale will depend on if they're working in specialty areas as well. So it'll be more than $38 um, an hour, depending on if you're a shift supervisor or if you're going to the OR. Uh, further education allows general duty technologists to move into other imaging areas. The CMRT, which is our professional body, offers certificates in CT, uh, IR, which is interventional radiography, and mammography. So these certificates have a series of online courses with a clinical experience component in the specialty area, but does not require a certification exam in the end, just the completion of the required courses. So even though you are taught um, and do have hands-on experience with a lot of those areas, once you actually graduate from the program and are a certified technologist, um, you can actually get certification in these areas um, and do more advanced work. Uh, MRI is another imaging modality that does not use radiation. Uh, similar to the previous, previously mentioned certificates, a graduate from a certified MRT program is required to take um, the MRI courses and complete a 16-week clinical practicum. Um, but this requires the successful completion of the national certification exam. So for MRI, you actually take the courses, do the clinical practicum, and then actually have to write another certification exam, just like you would for the general radiographer. At this time, the government is opening new CT and MRI scanners all over the province, which opens up um, a lot of casual uh, general uh, jobs for technologists. Um, so along with what we're experiencing with COVID and the backlog of cases there and um, all the retirements that are going on and with the CT and MRI scanners opening up, there are a lot of casual and part-time positions available. There are also laddering opportunities for degree completions offered at BCIT and other post-secondary institutes. And I think Gabriella will speak a little bit more about that from program advising. Um, our graduates are employed in hospitals and private clini clinics uh, within BC and across Canada. So once you've written the certification exam, you can work anywhere in uh, across Canada. Uh, if you wanted to work out of country, there's usually other certification exams that have to be written for those countries. Next, so, next slide, please. 
Um, so our, as our graduates gain experience and seniority, they can move on to other positions. And, and as I mentioned a few of them before, the shift supervisor uh, practice leads for um, their specific area, uh, site supervisors, clinical instructors, uh, and health authority imaging directors. And so usually an imaging director will have more than just one um, diagnostic area under its uh, grouping. Some technologists become product specialists working for the manuf manufacturing companies and um, usually selling the equipment and coming in and doing um, applied work with um, companies or, or hospitals or clinics that purchase their equipment. And that's it. So the next person uh, to come up would be Gabriella Nova from Program Advising. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. So yes, my name is Gabriella Nava, and I am a program advice, advisor here at BCIT. Program advisors will be helping you in any way related to your application and program entrance requirements. So we are here to help you. Next slide, please. OK, so it is very important that you check the entrance requirements of the program. And if you visit the program entrance webpage of our program, you will notice that the, this program has a competitive entry three-step process. So it is very important that you take a look into what are the preferences for selected applicants. So, it is very important that to consider that strong academic history, it is preferred, um, as well as relevant work or volunteer experience is also preferred, and a very good knowledge of the profession. Now, so that means that if you demonstrate interest in the field, um, the strong academic history means that the program looks for individuals with a very strong GPA, approximately three plus. Uh, it is important that you can apply with final grades rather than midterm grades. So what happens in a program that is competitive, what makes it competitive is because it is a very, very popular program and we receive about three times more applications than the number of seats that are available. So it's very important that you check what are the preferences that we give to shortlist applicants. Next, please. So very important to, to have the awareness that the program start date, the next one will be January 2022, and you have a chance to apply from January 2nd till June 30th. And we really recommend that you apply earlier, just in case there is something that you're missing that you can still have time to work on. So very important to give a very big importance to the deadline, June 30th. So the person who is gonna be accepted into the program would display very good communication skills. And of course, you need to be com com completely in, uh, comfortable working independently and also working in collaboration with in a team. Uh, you need to have excellent physical and mental abilities and health. And you would need to know also how to deal with management skills and time management skills and stress Stressful situations, you need to feel very comfortable managing stressful situations because the profession requires quite a bit of flow and is very dynamic. So you need to be very comfortable dealing with that. Um, you also need to have a very strong decision-making skills and you will probably have to be quick at problem solving. So there are situations that arise and you need to make sure that you feel comfortable and you're resource, resourceful in your mind and you know what is best to do. Uh, 
very highly recommended that you are computer literate, that you have great ability to to be visualize 3D situations in your manual dexterity is of course very important as well with the eye and hand coordination skills. Next please. So here is the application process. Very important that you make sure that you review all the entrance requirements that this program meets so you can demonstrate them. And if you do not have all the entrance requirements, it is very important that you take your time so you can upgrade what you need to upgrade. When you are ready and you know exactly that you have all that it takes to apply to this program, you would need to gather all your documents and all the additional documents that you need to demonstrate that you meet the requirements. And you will convert them on all into PDF files so you can upload them into your online application. Don't forget to complete the mandatory applicant questionnaire. Very important as you will, it, your experience will be reflected upon the questionnaire as well as your work experience and volunteer experience. You of course need to complete the CASPER entrance test. Very important for you to check the correct dates that are posted on the website. And you need to apply on our online application system. And of course, as I mentioned before, be very aware of the deadline. And if you could please make sure that you apply before, way before the deadline would be highly recommended. So what happens after you apply? After you apply, the department will have a short list of applicants that will be determined at a later time by the deadline. They will be determined what are the, the, the successful applicants. It is then when the department makes the final selection decision. You can expect about four to six weeks after the deadline for you to know if you were accepted into the program. So we really appreciate for you to be patient with this process, please. Next slide, please. So this program has a great opportunity of laddering your education and to further your education. Uh, whether you are interested in continuing your education at BCIT or all their post-secondary institutions, it is possible. This diploma is recognized. You can continuing, you can continue your education rather uh, to become a magnetic resonance imaging advanced certificate bachelor graduate of health science at BCIT, or if you wish to attend Thompson Rivers University, you can pursue a bachelor of health science. Another opportunity in this, uh, to further your education is through BCIT. If you would choose to take a health leadership advanced certificate with us, and also, Another opportunity at BCIT, it, it would be the Bachelor of Technology in Technology Management. So as you can see, you can further your education and continue your grades and gain a higher education. Next slide, please. So the Student Life Office and BCIT Students Association, both, we both applied this eight dimension model. This eight dimension model is to provide services and resources in support of each area of this model to all of our students. And this is to ensure the student well being. So, BCIT really supports every student that go to any program. These elements include your intellectual well being occupational, physical, financial, psychological, environmental, spiritual, and social needs to ensure that all students thrive and they can achieve their goals. Other important kind of support that we offer are the following. 
Next slide, please. As you can see, we have services that we offer also to support all the success of every one of the students. You, we have uh, an office with Indigenous services, so if you want to connect with them, they will be able to help you in any way if you are an Indigenous person. If you may be qualified for awards or bursaries or scholarships, you can connect with our financial aid and awards services. Uh, the BCIT Student Health Services also can assist you in different ways. We have a, an accessibility services. If you require certain environment or certain um, aspects that will allow you to do your homework or your studies more comfortable, you can connect with our accessibility services. They will help you with that. Uh, we have health services as well in campus when things go back to normal, hopefully soon. We even have a clinic that you can access to, but right now you can have, uh, as a student, you could have a Zoom appointment with a physician. We also offer Zoom appointments with counseling, uh, counseling advisors uh, for you to continue your development. And we offer also recreational services. Right now, due to COVID, we offer a variety of classes that you can take in a, in a virtual way and you can be part of the healthy living. And BCIT support all these aspects of the well being so you can feel supported and you can have a good equivalent and equilibrium between your studies and your well being. Next slide, please. So what happens after this session ends and you still have questions and you have doubts and you want to make sure that all that you have gathered it is, is correct? Well, if you have any questions, you can connect with program advisors either by phone Monday through Friday or via email. And you can see the email address is right here. And once you have really been familiarized with the program's website, and you still have a question and you would rather meet with a program advisor via Zoom, you can request a Zoom appointment with us. These are the two very important parts of information for you to connect with, with program advising. Please make sure that you keep uh, information, write down the, the email address and this website. Next slide, please. So BCIT has presence in many different ways and platforms. You can look at us uh, through Facebook and Instagram and uh, a great source of information. I strongly suggest to you to check our YouTube videos. We have excellent videos with very great descriptions of our programs and what is the life in a student look like at BCIT. You can connect with those in so many different ways, and you can connect with program advising as well this way. Next slide, please. And now we have arrived to the question and answers part of the information session. And I believe that we have a variety of questions already in the chat. So we can start answering some of those questions. Thank you, Gabrielle and Denise. That was very excellent information. And it looks like we have a few more minutes to answer some questions. Excellent. Would anybody be- um, Hi. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, DJ. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to respond to emails and the, or sorry, um, chat questions here. So just bear with me here. I've responded to a couple of them. Um, so volunteer requirements, that's a, a question that keeps coming up. So volunteer is not preferred, it's a, it's a mandatory requirement. And I understand with COVID, it is a bit difficult. Um, it's challenging getting volunteer work, but that is not a, a requirement that we're removing. Um, the requirements, um, the volunteer um, criteria is on the program entry page. 
do read that. Um, that's very important. And um, if you are humming and hawing about applying, um, definitely start your research on volunteer work because it is going to be challenging. I'm going to be honest with you. It's going to be challenging, but keep be persistent. Um, we had people getting volunteer work right up at the 11th hour last time. Um, so this is one I might ask Denise to field. How is the program different from the old program? Um, if you don't mind fielding that question. Yeah. I'll, I'll get no the problem. Um, so part of that is a representative of the changes that we've made to the requirements. So we used to have um, anatomy and physiology courses in the program, but we've removed those with the expectancy that they will be, be met in the prerequisites coming into the program. So our anatomy that we're focusing on will be the relational aspect of the anatomy and the organs. It will be on the, um, the bony structures. Um, and so our focus is more towards the type of cases and procedures that we do. Um, the other piece would be the, the physiology that you're taught in the prerequisite courses are a requirement because we do teach you pathology. So we've increased the um, number of pathology courses that we're um, doing in the program. And that's actually to meet our nat national competency profile, which is what our profession is based on. So they've increased the number of pathologies in there. And so we've, we've now had to increase that um, that content in our program. So we've removed that. Um, the physics, the physics will be taught as part of um, our uh, radiographic science courses. So with the equipment, whereas before we used to have separate physics courses, uh, we're hoping to have a physics instructor and a technologist teaching the those courses so that you're going to get the best of both worlds. So you will learn more physics in the program specific to x-ray, uh, but the uh, requirement is now physics 12. Um, the other component is that we have increased some of the clinical time, but it's more specific to the CT clinical versus to the general radiography. So CT is becoming more and more prevalent uh, in our profession, uh, and there's a higher expectancy that students come out um, on being able to practice CT as soon as they graduate, uh, where it never used to be like that in the past. So we've increased that component as well. And then some of it is just reshuffling our courses to realign our courses. And we've actually added a research course. And again, that's an addition to the competency profile to meet that piece as well. I think that's it. And the start date. So there was a question regarding when will the next intake be? So from now on, um, all of our intakes will be January of, uh, so at the beginning of each year. So the next one is January, 2022, which is the one you're applying to. The next one will be January, 2023. Something that I would like to uh, share with everybody is there are quite a few questions that I am looking at that you would find the answers to, and it is extremely, extremely rec highly recommended to check the frequently asked questions or in the website. If you visit the frequently asked questions for the admissions of this program, you will, you will find out that most of the questions that everybody has been asking, you can find the answers there. And if you start looking into the frequently asked questions for the admissions, you can start mapping what is the, the the path that you need to follow. The answers of a lot of the questions that you may have are in that section. Okay, so I'm just going to start um, answering a bunch here. Um, I, I think we have a couple minutes. Um, so last thing I'm going to say about volunteer work, um, I, I know there's a lot of questions about it. It is on the program entry page. Please read that very detailed. It does say why we don't accept certain things. It does say what we will accept. So it's, it's all on there. Um, Casper, so yes, you do need to, um, when you apply to the program, you can write it um, you can write the test before, or if you happen to apply, let's say you apply today and the next CASPER date is in, I don't know when the next date is offhand. Um, it's at the top of the page. The next date is on February 21st. So you still got three weeks. Um, you will probably receive a letter saying your application is incomplete. That's fine. You have a deadline to meet those um, requirements. So you can just say, 
contact admissions, just say, hi, I, I'm going to be writing the February 21st date. So they will have that, they will know. So you can write the test before or you can write it afterwards, it's fine, but you do have to do uh, meet it, it's part of your requirements. Um, is post-secondary education required? Yes, there is um, a post-secondary education requirement of English. And you can do um, contact program advising and they can let you know what are some of the English um, courses you can take at BCIT. Um, there's also six credits of human anatomy and physiology required. So that's post-secondary. And once again, program advising can help you with that. Um, when is the next intake after 2022? That's going to be 2023, January. Um, is there a wait list? I, Denise already answered that. Yes, there is a wait list. Um, so shortlisted applicants will be wait listed. Um, should you apply early if you, st if you don't have your final grades until May or April or May? Yes, because you can apply with your midterm grade. So as long as you meet the minimum requ entrance requirement, you can apply with your midterm grade, but you may be asked to submit your final grade. So make sure you still um, do well and meet the entrance requirement of the minimum grade required. Um, as someone who's been out of school for 10 years um, regarding upgrading, are there free courses you can take to upgrade? Um, so for the high school, um, Gabriella, do you want to field that one or? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was just about to finish a question, um, written question. Give me one second. Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, sorry, DJ, can you please re uh, give me the question back again, please? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was answering someone else's question. Um, as someone who's been out of school for 10 years in regards to upgrading, are there free courses we can take to upgrade? So uh, maybe speak to the um, high school courses? Well, yes. So there are some high school courses that you can take to meet the requirements that will be free for Canadian residents and Canadian citizens. However, if you have a chance to upgrade uh, it is strongly recommended, as you can see in the preferred criteria for applicants, to upgrade with post-secondary education. If I was very interested in this program and I need to upgrade my education, I would not upgrade with high school. I would upgrade with post-secondary education because that would make your application more competitive. Uh, we're talking about three times more applications than the number of seats available. And as you can see, preference is given to people with post-secondary education. So that would be my recommendation. I hope that, uh, that answered the question. The average GPA I see that someone is asking that, uh, that is three plus. Am I correct, uh, Denise? Um, sorry. It, the the next intake, intake, I think DJ mentioned it, and it was would be January 2023. So this will just be our normal cycle moving forward. Right. And if someone was asking, uh, what would be, what is the average GPA of an applicant who has been accepted into the program? And what I mentioned, I believe that uh, it is three plus. Am I correct, DJ? Um. You know what, that's, I don't really have that information right now, like uh, available to me, but you know what, like we keep saying, apply. If you have the minimum, apply. We're not gonna discourage you from applying. If you have the opportunity to upgrade while you've already applied, submit your new grade. So if you apply today and you meet the 73% requirement, apply, don't, don't be hesitant about it. And then you know what, if you choose to upgrade and then you end up getting 85% in the same course, contact admissions, let them know, hey, I've upgraded, and then we'll add the new score to your, um, to your application. So don't be hesitant based on your grades. Just as long as you meet the minimum requirement, we just encourage you to apply. Um, and about and regarding the, the GPA, I, I just wanted to mention that it's not the only thing that we look at because we mm -hmm. do look at the, the CASPER scores as well. So um, the GPA is just a part of it. So... Totally. And the frequently asked questions even mentioned that preference will be given to applicants with a strong GPA, but also, as it has been mentioned, post-secondary education uh, demonstrated interest in the field and related volunteer or work experience is very important. So those combined achievements will demonstrate the aptitude for success. Again, these questions you can find in the frequently asked questions of the website, in, of the program. Um, I've 
There's some questions about recency. So if your courses are more than five years old, once again, still apply. We removed the five-year recency. Um, it, it is good to have recent um, education, but um, once again, if you meet the minimum <laughs> requirements, do not be deterred from applying. Um, and, and if you do just for yourself want to upgrade or, or take the course again or do a challenge exam or something like that, you're more than welcome to. Um, I'm just running through the questions right now. We have gone a couple minutes over our limit. So if there's something that's very important for everybody to hear, um, we can certainly do another question. But it is time to move along. I just want to quick, um, quickly address a question from Gary B. just regarding um, work history. Um, and the work history, it might be something that we look at. It's not always, but usually your experiences, experiences usually, um, especially if they're customer <laughs> related or in stressful, stressful environments, that usually comes through in your Casper interview as well and, and just how you handle those questions um, through those interviews. So even though we don't specifically say you should be working and in this field or, or that field and these are the type of people we take that usually comes through in in the casper testing that's it <laughs> excellent thank you denise really appreciate that thank you uh and dj thank you very much for your help with that um anyone who didn't get their questions answered um there should be two email addresses on here for medical radiography if it's a program specific question or if it's a admissions question you can contact program underscore advising at bcit.ca and you will definitely get your questions answered that way. I just wanted to say that a copy of the slide presentation will be sent out to all the registrants uh, later in the week. And there's also more info sessions all week. So if you want to join some more and find out some more about the excellent programs in health sciences, you can do that. And other than that, I want to thank you all for being with us today and we just wish you all the best with your future in health sciences. So thank you, Darren. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.